talk to me a little bit about the difference between total testosterone and free testosterone. Yeah. So after your, your testes get that signal, they produce the testosterone. Testosterone is a hormone. It's, uh, you, you can look at it as being like a lipid. It's fat soluble. So it doesn't mix well with water. Everybody's tried to mix oil into water and you know, our, our blood is this aqueous source. So it's kind of a water based. We need a carrier protein to carry it around. And our body produces something called sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG. Usually most of our, our testosterone is bound to SHBG. Some of it is bound to other carrier proteins like albumin. And SHBG is basically, you can kind of look at it as like a bus. It's a transport protein, takes your hormone from one area of the body and brings it to another. It also helps to regulate. So we don't want too much free testosterone because then we would kind of be sympathetically overdriven. If we just have all of these high levels of testosterone and nothing to regulate or put a break on it. You know, we're going to have a too much signal. So SHBG is super complex. And this is something that like I'm, I don't fully understand. I don't think anybody does. I've, I've spent so much time in the literature trying to look at SHBG, but the, the message that's usually kind of touted or, or kind of reported is that you want your SHBG kind of as low as possible and you want your free testosterone as high as possible. Cause if SHBG is high, it's binding up a lot of that testosterone Correct. and then it's, it's not free to actually have actions Correct. through the body. hundred percent. My pushback to that would be the healthier you get an individual, the higher their SHBG goes. So the you know, That's SHBG, counterintuitive. Right. <laughs> yeah. Why would a healthy individual have no testosterone unless, you know, we're meant to have low levels of testosterone? It just doesn't make sense. But don't women have higher SHBG than they men? can. Yeah. They, they can. can. Yeah. Okay. Um, and SHBG does bind up estradiol too, but it binds to DHT with a higher affinity than testosterone, testosterone, mm. higher affinity than estradiol. So it's kind of like how ApoB is chaperoning triglycerides right. and cholesterol through the blood. Yep. Again, exactly. they're not, they're not it's water soluble. Yeah. This is the same sort of thing. Testosterone needs to be shuttled. Yep. It's SHBG. Uh, GB that's doing that. Yeah. Some testosterone rides along on lipoproteins like that too. So small amount of it, but yeah, any of these proteins that a hormone or a lipid can bind to and get through, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting that the healthier you are, the higher SHBG is kind of counterintuitive. Like you said, doesn't really make a lot of sense. If you look at say a type two diabetic or somebody with metabolic syndrome, somebody has high amounts of inflammation, high amounts of insulin, they have very low SHBG. Um, so it, SHBG is suppressed by insulin and, and high inflammation. Um, so my pushback would be, I kind of look at SHBG and this whole free testosterone hypothesis to almost be like propagated by the TRT clinics. When somebody comes in with say a good total and then they have a low, they can say, well, you're, you're free is low. You know, I think you need this TRT. And sometimes it is the case. But I'm going to contradict myself a, a lot uh, throughout this whole, this whole process of talking about testosterone because there's so many nuances. Sometimes guys do have very high SHBG, very low free testosterone, and they don't feel great and they have symptoms. But a lot of times they don't. And symptoms are hands down the most important thing to think about when we're talking about testosterone. I'll repeat that the whole time. Yeah, I don't think you're necessarily contradicting yourself. I, th I can see how it may seem contradictory to the listener, but what I'm hearing from you is that the context... Matters. Yes. Yeah. There's a, just, you know, a lot of nuance because when we talk about testosterone, why I don't like to even focus on really numbers or anything is because everybody is a genetic individual that has genetic differences. But Adam, we love numbers. I know we do. We do. <laughs> it's so hard. I want to target. It's really hard too for, for doctors don't really understand that too. And we talk about the reference ran ranges and, you know, I've seen guys who have like a 200 testosterone. I mean, I've seen, you know, prominent 200 total testosterone yeah, 200 total and that's in like nanograms, nanograms per deciliter. per deciliter. So extremely low. And these are guys who a lot of people know and look up to as being like just beasts, you know, like professional athletes, influencers. And they tell me the truth, what they've done in the past, what they're doing now. And they'll be like, you know, my testosterone's always been low, but I just always grow muscle. I feel good. Feel Everybody right. thinks I'm on steroids. I swear I'm not. And, you know, we're, they don't have any reason to lie to me. And I've seen it time and time again. Conversely, though, sometimes a guy comes in with like a 500 and every symptom under the book and he's doing everything else right. He's getting good sleep, nutrition, his his mental health is good. Everything is good, but he feels awful and you give him some testosterone and increase that and he feels better. So it's all about symptoms and it's all over the book. You know, it's all over the place. Yeah, I want, I want to put a pin in yes. SHBG and come back to it because I showed you some of my lab results mm -hmm. and I made some tweaks on supplements and SHBG. BG went up. Yeah. 
um, <laughs> it went up a little bit. And the, the least the lab report I got suggested that that wasn't great. Right. But total testosterone went up as well. So we'll, we'll, let's come back to that. But what do you think about the idea that uh, your free test should be about 2% of your total test? Yeah, I think that's fair. That's kind of a, an average that we see. That's usually kind of where it falls, you, two, two plus, like to three. We don't want it too low because then you you don't have that testosterone available to have its effect. We also don't want it too high because as I said, you know, when, when you have your free testosterone too high, guys get very sympathetically driven. So they get that fight or flight. And this is something I see all the time. Guys always think more testosterone, the better. But if you actually talk to a lot of the bodybuilders, when they're at their peak, their highest doses, they don't feel good. You feel awful because you feel that fight or flight all the time. So you kind of like when testosterone or most things, it's kind of this curvilinear, uh, you know, graph where if it's too low, you don't feel good. And if it's too high, you don't feel good. And a lot of the side effects fall within that too. But guys will come in with, you know, lack of uh, a poor erection quality, low libido, and their levels are high. And I'm like, let's bring it down. And that, that doesn't make sense to them. They're like, no, 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 more is better. But I, you know, I try to tell people like, you know, sex is a mixture of both parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, right? You need to be relaxed in order to have sex. You're so sympathetically driven right now. Your mind thinks you're running from a saber tooth tiger or something, you know, like, cause you're always on. And so it's hard for you to get an erection because your your body's in fight or flight it's not in reproduce mode um so that happens a lot too with too high of free testosterone what, what happens to estrogen if you have really high testosterone it, it will go up too because the testosterone is then being aromatized into estrogen right. if you have a lot of aromatase and that can that be part of that explanation as to why libido could be affected it could be but actually estrogen is something that i think kind of got inappropriately um, demonized for a long time. And now we find that estrogen has a plethora of benefits. It's actually a really good paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they their, their conclusion to the results that they did was that TRT, the benefits of TRT are actually via increasing estrogen, not the testosterone. Because they took guys and they put them on aromatase inhibitors or selective estrogen receptor modulator SERMs, and they blocked the effects of estrogen and all the symptoms came back. And for years, guys, by endocrinology standards are put immediately on an anti-estrogen drug when they're initiated TRT. And we find that when we take those out, symptom relief occurs. I honestly think, I believe that most of the benefits of testosterone, when you hear of cardiovascular, neurological, that's all coming through estrogen. So we don't want to just arbitrarily lower estrogen to some certain number. Mm, that's going to be news to some people. Oh, absolutely. You know, I think a lot, a lot of people assume that estrogen is the, it's the female sex hormone right yeah and in that study the guys who had lower estrogen had more adiposity they had more body fat and they had less libido and poor erection quality so the more the estrogen went up they got leaner they got better erections mm -hmm. they had better libido there you go how were the the you said you don't really like numbers but let's just think about the the current reference ranges for total testosterone and for free testosterone were were they developed based on like building strength on libido. Yeah. How did we come to those numbers? Yeah, this is a really good discussion. Again, now I'm going to kind of, I'm going to like, you know, kind of counter myself because I think that the numbers that we have are terrible. I'll say why, because you know, we first had these ranges kind of around 2011, I think it was, and they took a data set of four studies. It was uh, the Framingham heart study that you know of. Um, there was two osteoporosis studies and there was a aging male, European aging male study. So like four, or it was like 9,000 kind of participants. I think they took a hundred people from each group. And they came out with these reference ranges in 2011. And I'm going to go based off nanogram per deciliter. It was 350 nanograms per deciliter all the way up to 1200. In 2017, they took that same data set and then they did this really complex uh, statistical analysis on it. They called it harmonizing, where they harmonized all of these groups and they changed the reference ranges and then and they dropped it to the left. So everything went down. So now the ranges are 264 nanograms per deciliter up to 916. So if in 2011 you had a testosterone of 300, you were hypogonadal and you were treated. In 2017, you're no longer hypogonadal. Here's an SSRI all of your symptoms are in your head, you know, get lost. You don't have low testosterone. So now a lot of guys have just been, you know, kind of mistreated, I think, because we changed the reference ranges so dramatically. 
uh, we know that testosterone is dropping decade after decade. You know, our testosterone levels are lower than our father's. Our father's testosterone is lower than his father's. And we're making the reference ranges kind of, you know, illustrate that, which doesn't make sense to me. Our testosterone levels are lower than our father's. His were lower than his father's. Correct. At the same age. Correct. So when they were, you know, 35 or 37 or whatever it is, right. they had higher testosterone levels. Yes. So we're seeing that as a trend, this downward trend of yes. testosterone declining. Why? Testosterone and fertility. So there's a lot of debate there. I don't have the answer. My guess would probably be environmental exposures. I think, you know, the endocrine disrupting particles, microplastics, you know, microplastics exactly. Things that our ancestors, or I hate that word, but, you know, mm -hmm. people above, before us that weren't really exposed to, uh, to the extent that we are. Uh, but also, I mean, excess adiposity, high amounts of inflammation, you know, all of these things contribute. Right maybe poor mental health and stress. Absolutely. We don't, I mean, also I like more on a, you know, just a kind of hypothesizing, we don't have a hard life really anymore. You know, why do we need high levels of testosterone to get us through it? You know, so things are so easy. And I, I don't know that like evolutionarily it's been long enough to make a change like that, but there's so many things that contribute. Hmm. So what would you like to see that that range as just go back to that 350 to, to 1200 as a yeah. normal range? Well, my biggest, biggest issue with the way that they did the harmonization of that is that they, they based it off of what they deemed healthy. So their, uh, their inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria was that they, they basically went off BMI. And so they said non-obese males without a disease like diabetes. I didn't see them mention pre-diabetes. Um, they weren't testing things like fasting insulin. They weren't testing things like CRP. It was just, were you non-obese on BMI? And there's a really interesting study. I think it was in 2023 in the uh, frontiers of nutrition where they took DEXA with BMI. And they looked at people who had a, a normal uh, BMI that was you know, below 30, below mm -hmm. obese. And around 70% of the men in there had excess adiposity, meaning uh, you know, obese adiposity. So tw uh, greater than 25% body fat, which is what bariatric surgeons- But they were considered normal. They would be considered normal. Uh, so it come, that, that comes down to body composition. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. I mean, and so if you're taking a study and you're looking at the, you know, levels of testosterone and what you call healthy men, but your men aren't actually healthy, they may be highly inflamed. They may have this excess adiposity. They may be pre-diabetic. Undermuscled. Yeah. You know, are these people actually healthy young males? I would argue not. We don't have a study with a good group of men who are like, you know, probably 15 and lower percent body fat who have their fast and insulin chat who have their CRP chat. It's very similar to like, uh, ApoB, for example, you know, yeah. when you're looking at it, you know, somebody like you who cares about this, who looks at the literature probably knows that it's better to have your ApoB probably below 60, you know, to really be ideal, but the reference ranges say 90. And if you go into your doc and you say, Hey, mine's 90, they're going to say you're good. You know? So it's very similar to testosterone. The reference ranges probably aren't ideal for optimal health. And, and that's my biggest pushback on I'm it. Surprised there hasn't been a study on, I don't know, folks in the army, males in the army or something. Yeah. I know that would be good. That'd be a good cohort. Yeah. It'd be, it'd just be hard. Cause that, you would need a DEXA scan, which would be extremely expensive. You know, if you DEXA like 5,000 people, and then you were also looking at those more in-depth lab markers, like the fasting insulin and CRP, I think it would be a tough study, but we need one. I think if we're going, you know, we're going off of this, this T score that says the, you know, the, the range of healthy young men. Well, the TRT clinics are surely making enough money to fund that. That's true.